Welcome to a new episode of Veil Lifted, a video essay where I discuss fascinating cases that involve secrecy and discovery. Today we will be discussing the Buddha Field cult. As of today, it feels as though there is a significant documentation about most cults. There are people who came forward, there are multiple published books and documentaries, and it feels as though much is out in the open. The Buddha Field cult, however, is not one of those cults. It is still shrouded in mystery, and the major source of information is a documentary that was released in 2016. The documentary, titled Holy Hell, was directed by and stars Will Allen, a man who actually was part of this cult. Allen joined the cult right out of college, where he graduated with a film degree. In 1985, he had been forced to leave home when his mother was made aware he was gay. This was a turning point in Alan's life, as he would end up being invited by his sister to join what was referred to as a meditation group in West Hollywood. This group was led by Michel Rostand, the leader of the Buddha Field cult. As time progressed, Alan became the resident videographer in the cult, or propaganda minister, filming hours of their activities with Michel. However, much of this footage remained with the cult, leaving Alan with around 35 hours of edited footage. Alan stayed in the cult for 22 years and left in 2007, feeling directionless. After seeing a film titled Keep the Lights On, Alan decided to compile his footage of the Buddha Field cult. Alan is a key figure in the story as he not only documented the inside happenings, but was also a member, giving us an inside and outside perspective. Though this episode includes information other than from the Holy Hell documentary, much of it will rely on Alan's documentary, as previously stated, there is little known besides that. Before discussing the cult itself, the leader needs to be contextualized. The leader, named Michel Rostand, had multiple names. On IMDb.com, he is Michel Gomez, an actor who was in a scene of the film Rosemary's Baby, released in 1968. He was a background character named Pedro. However, his real name is Jaime Gomez, though IMDb.com lists his nicknames, Andreas, Reggie, the teacher, and Michel Rostand. This uncertainty of a detail as simple as his name is ironically a suited metaphor for this man generally, underlining how little the public truly knows about this man. However, for the purposes of this episode, he will be named Michel. Very little is known about Michel's life. One of the few facts known is that he dabbled in gay porn under the pseudonym Dirk, and to this day, Falcon Studios, one of the largest producers of gay pornography, still hosts his videos. Michel is often described as a very attractive man, and as the story continues, his appearance and that of others will become increasingly significant. However, outside of this, all that is known about him is in direct connection to his cult. There even is a debate on whether to call this group a cult, as people were allowed to leave, and it supposedly simply was a spiritual group. I refer to it as a cult due to the indoctrination and abuse that will be discussed further on in this episode. The cult was a place that exuded positivity and the idea that people would get answers. Alan himself joined for that reason. The members remember the beginning of the cult as being an overwhelmingly spiritual and inviting environment about love and living well. This was not my path. I got accepted into grad school. I was going to get a PhD in child psychology. I had my whole life planned out. And then I met some of these people. They were so alive, moving from their heart and playing and jumping in ice cold rivers and hiking through the forest at night. And oh my God, I want me some of that. Some of them were some of the smartest, most beautiful people I've ever met in my life. We started it. This is what we wanted. It was our little utopia in the middle of this big giant city. Constantly you were being fed, like your soul was being fed with love and with inspiration and awe. I wanted everybody, everybody in the world to experience this. I can remember feeling so fulfilled. I said, Dad, I want to give my life to God. And he was on the next flight out there. <laughs> to come get me. Many of the members were vulnerable. Some had been kicked out of home at a young age. Some experienced a violent life in the streets. Some had been forced into a religion that was fundamentalist. In the end, they all were looking for relief and for meaning in their lives. Michel told the members that he had a master who had led him to a spiritual awakening, which made them feel as though he knew more, and more importantly, knew the answers to their questions. A big part of Michel's charm was also the fact that he supposedly spoke multiple languages, was artistic, was able to dance, and was the opposite of the typical guru in that he wore speedos and was current, compared to the stereotype of an old man in a robe. For many of the members, the Buddha field functioned as a family. They lived and ate together, and were together most of the time. This made their investment deep and committed. 
The Buddha Field became a group project in that members worked so they could each pay for their rent, for groceries, and most even went as far as buying and building whatever was necessary for the supposed family. Being in top physical condition was also a large part of the Buddha Field. The members consistently exercised and lived as cleanly as possible. The group sometimes had Shakti sessions where the master, Michel, supposedly transferred his energy to them. Members convulsed, fainted, and felt a new bliss, a change in themselves that made them feel as if they would never leave the cult. The next member refers to it as a feeling similar to being on LSD. One big concept that Michel included was called the knowing, the direct experience of God. This was taken from a Hindu text, the Bhagdara Kita, where Krishna discloses the direct experience of God to his disciple Arjuna. I was like, yes. That resonated with me. I was like, I knew. I knew it was possible. The knowing was the realization of being able to see and hear and taste God. You could only comprehend what this means to finally have God being revealed to you in its purest form. Finally. That was something that I felt like I had been looking for my entire life up to that point. I had gone to school, I had a degree, I had a great job, I was engaged, and yet when this happened, it was like all of that meant nothing. So who wants to ask for the knowing today? One of the things that made the knowing so intriguing was that not everyone is going to be able to receive it. I wanted what I thought he had. I wanted the knowing. I wanted this promise of enlightenment. The ceremony of the knowing occurred over a few days. Members were told they had to give everything up, and if they hadn't, he would know. And only if they had, and they were ready, would they receive the experience. Alan was afraid he wasn't ready. However, one night Michel told Alan he had been quote-unquote fighting with God because according to him, Alan was fated to have a terrible accident that would lead to his death. Michel said that by following his guidance, he would be all right, and Alan trusted him. This day was going to meet God, okay? Not the president, not Brad Pitt. This was God. So you didn't want to take this lightly. We were up in the woods, and he looks into your eyes with now, this open eye meditation that's so overwhelming. And he said, what do you want? And I told him that I wanted to have the knowing revealed to me. He said, hmm, but it was very doubtful. He was really playing with that for me. He said, bow down, and I did. And he said, you will receive the knowing you will know God directly. Alan was granted the knowing, though it left him feeling overwhelmed as if it were too much too soon. Then, Alan began service, a form of free work for Michel personally, having more access to him than others. In this way, he found out more about Michel, such as the fact that aside from an actor, he had been a ballet dancer. Michel was constantly working on his physique. In fact, Alan, along with a man named Philippe, moved into the apartment next door to Michel's and turned their living room into a dance studio for him further displaying the intense and consistent adoration they had for him. Michel began teaching ballet classes to the members, or rather, his disciples. Most of the disciples hated it. It was extremely strict, taxing, and stressful. Michel asked them to repeat their actions over and over for hours. His obsession with the physical became even more intense when Michel told Alan he had to abstain from sex entirely. 
Michel said that sexual orgasm was a form of death and they needed a spiritual orgasm. However, apparently no one was abstaining. It simply was a secret and a facade. To be a person is to be a mask. And you never know who you're talking to behind the mask. The real person is somewhere inside that mask. You had to stand naked in front of God as he's made you in your body of light. The master only represents God on the earth. And if you can stand naked in front of your master, you can stand naked in front of your God. Know that. Soon, Michel escalated. He asked his disciples to change their names in order to move on from their pasts and have a new chapter. This seemed like a positive change until he also asked for people to disassociate themselves from their families. Parents were concerned, shocked, and one family even hired a private investigator. He found out about the group and didn't think it was dangerous and therefore their daughter would be fine. Another family wanted to hire someone to deprogram their daughter, but as she was an adult, she could not be forced. In 1991, a turning point occurred. A man outside the group had fallen in love with a cult member, stalked her, and as he made no progress, he decided to go to the Cult Awareness Network, an organization owned by Rick Ross. Now, the narrative turned the Buddha field into a cult to the public, and even worse, a cult that was supposedly holding said woman hostage. The Cult Awareness Network often had parents paying for their children to be kidnapped out of cults and subsequently deprogrammed. Michel's response to this narrative was to escape. He left in the middle of the night with a few of his disciples and the others were to stay in LA and wait for instruction. Those left behind were incredibly devastated and felt abandoned. Michel finally decided that they would settle in Austin, Texas, where a disciple bought him a house. This is also when he changed his name from Michel Rostan to Andreas in order to avoid being found by anyone looking for him. After some time off the radar, he decided to let the rest of the disciples know, and they moved to join him. In Austin, the disciples and Michel recruited members. The running theme between all these people was beauty. Everyone was attractive. In 1993, the Waco siege occurred less than 100 miles from where the Buddha field cult lived. This siege of a cult compound led by David Korish ended up in 76 deaths. Michel saw this and became paranoid that he too was going to die like Korish and that the cult was no longer safe. This paranoia led to class exercises where Michel would tell his disciples how to respond if they were ever interviewed by the FBI. There was a heavy emphasis on them saying that they did not know of Michel at all. In fact, Michel was absolutely devoted to secrecy to the point where his disciples lied to their families in extreme ways. They would send postcards from Europe when in reality they'd never left. They'd say they moved to Mexico when they were in Austin. They all tried to make the water as murky as possible as to their real situation. Michel's love for theater and ballet continued. And at one point he even got his disciples to build him a theater. He'd come and see their work every so often. And when he didn't like it, the disciples would tear it apart and rebuild it to his liking. Once it was built, every day they had rehearsals for a play. These rehearsals lasted hours and people even left their jobs in order to be present. Michel made these plays extravagant with costumes and set decoration and each play would only show once and the only audience was the disciples who also were partaking in the play. This extensive rehearsing and production only served to show how much Michel wished he were in the limelight of the entertainment world. He wished to be treated like the actor he was not. He continued to control the life of his disciples by banning entertainment such as books, radio, and television. Michel's obsession with beauty escalated to the point where he began suggesting surgery, as well as his imposed exercising. He himself began to show that he'd been wearing makeup and had had plastic surgery himself. This showed the contradictory nature of Michel. He said that the body was only a vessel and to focus on the spiritual, yet he demanded that everyone fit his exact standard of beauty. The standard of beauty also extended to pregnancy. Any disciple that was pregnant was instructed to immediately terminate and get an abortion. Whenever a disciple left the cult, Michel would spread lies about them and insist that no one was to communicate with them. He manipulated the disciples by convincing them that outside of the group, only negative things would happen to them, from the contraction of AIDS to prostitution to death. He used his abilities as a hypnotherapist to manipulate each individual in a way they could not refute. In 2006, a disciple who was leaving the group sent out an email with a series of serious accusations against Michel. One of the accusations was that for years, Michel had been forcing sexual acts with male disciples. While Michel denied everything, 
In reality, he had been having coerced sexual relationships with disciples for years. In one-on-one -on -one sessions, each charging $50, Michel asked his disciples about sexual fantasies about men, bringing up sexual scenarios. He began asking disciples to kiss him, to take off their clothes, all under the guise of a spiritual exercise. He began coercing his male disciples into sex, and even when they hinted at not wanting to, he simply ignored them and carried on. When one disciple resisted, he would begin the same way he began hypnotherapy sessions, by rerouting their resistance as resistance to someone else. He made every effort to shift their resistance onto anything or anyone but him. None of the disciples used the term rape in regards to his actions. However, it is clear that any sexual activity was not consensual, but rather coerced and manipulated. Slowly, male disciples began telling their friends about what had been happening. Alan shared that he too was one of the disciples that underwent Michel's abuse. Michel told him that he was saving his life and this was how his teacher had taught him. As people began to open up about what they had experienced with Michel, the pieces began coming together. Together. He had been feeding each individual a different narrative, and once people began to speak, they began to see who Michel really was. Once people confronted him, he denied all the allegations, but the disciples saw his face change, his eyes grew dark. Michel asked his disciples to attend a meeting where a video of him was shown. What this is cannot be put it in a biographical letter. He doesn't need rest of this about a story, but this is it's free, untouched, unpolluted, not apologized. There were some people that for the first time I saw in a gathering that got up and like, I don't know, 10 or 20 people left while that video was going on because it was so disturbing. This is when the spell broke. And just like that, disciples began to leave in the masses. Michel then asked a disciple who was still in the dark about his behavior to see if she could ruin people who were trying to ruin him. He wanted to destroy those who were telling the truth and exposing his predatory behavior. Some of the ex-disciples threatened to sue him, but said they'd leave him alone as long as he stopped being a teacher. This is when they decided to relocate him to Hawaii to hopefully give him a new start, a new chapter that did not include him being a maniacal guru. The ex-disciples described the end of this community as a huge death, or the equivalent of a bomb going off in a village, leaving everything destroyed. This is where the story should have ended with Michel. However, in Hawaii, he simply created a new group. He was found and filmed with new followers by a cinematographer named Polly Morgan, who often had to hide behind bushes to film him. Michel had renamed himself Reiji, which translates to God King. It was clear he had simply rebranded himself and recreated a community that deeply believed in him. One of his ex-disciples wore a hidden camera and microphone, while another filmed in a hidden location. Exchange was disturbing as Michel seemed to be completely at peace. Disciples, I see, yeah? No. People come and go. This is pretty much like people pass through. Well, are you being a good boy? <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Don't you think you should learn what that is? <laughs> good and bad. Better to find out what is best. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even being your best boy. I'm just being. Since 2007, more people have come forth exposing his sexual and mental abuse. Aside from this documentary, I have not been able to trace Michel or whatever name he goes by now. This is the last we know of him. I don't think my opinion is unpopular here. Genuinely, I think this man is a predator, 
and also mentally unwell. And when I say that, I think that he has a very delusional concept of himself. Most cult leaders do because most people who think that they're God, uh, you know, I don't think I have to explain why that doesn't make sense to me and why most of the time there's something else going on in their heads, there's some, some issue. We know for a fact that he wanted to be an actor and that he did act a bit, but since he wasn't talented, that never took off, so he never really had the career he wanted. And I think being a kind of guru or whatever was his way of being an actor because it was all an act. I don't think he bought most of his bullshit. I think he was trying to get attention and be adored because that's really what actors get, attention and adoration and people who love them and think they can do no wrong. I don't know if he had some kind of hang up about his sexuality where he didn't really want to be like a regular person who like dates or hooks up or whatever. So they resort to this kind of predatory hush hush behavior. But overall, I am honestly very disturbed by the fact that we don't know much about him at all and by the fact that he's still probably active, like I know he's getting older, but he probably still has some kind of following. He created a new following when he was in Hawaii, so there's no reason for me to believe that he's moved on to something else, which is scary because potentially we still have people who are getting raped, really, and coerced into sex, and who are getting taken advantage of. And the one thing that I want to make clear, because I didn't really mention it prior, but when people leave cults, if you've seen any documentaries about cults, you know this, they have a horrible time. It's not just like leaving a hotel and you go home, because there's no home to go to. You've disassociated yourself from your family. You haven't had a job in a while. You probably don't have money. Some people don't even have bank accounts, phone numbers, nothing. So it's like, in a sense, it's like you're born again and you're alone. And the prospect of that happening again to new people who are currently in his cult or who have been in his cult recently, the Hawaii one, that's really disgusting. The predatory shit is disgusting, of course, but also the aftermath that I feel isn't often considered. It just makes me really sad for the people who, you know, fall for this guy's act and really mad at him. And I'm kind of amazed that not many people have really talked about this or that it hasn't been broadcasted, you know, like that there aren't more movies and documentaries about this. I was actually talking to my best friend about this and she was saying that it was because no one's died. And so until nobody dies, it's like people undermine how extreme something is. It's like it has to have death or some catastrophic happening. I think there have been catastrophic results. Obviously, people were raped, people were manipulated. Alan was there for 22 years. Like, what does that do to your brain to be manipulated for that long? I think that is catastrophic in its own way. And so I wish more people were talking about it because we don't know where this creepy ass Michel is and what he's up to and God knows what else he's done, you know, before he was this guru. Who even knows? There might be so much that is potentially even worse which is horrifying. Anyways guys, thank you so much for watching. Let me know what you think in the comments down below and if there's a topic you'd like for me to cover in the next episode of Veil Lifted, feel free to leave a suggestion down below. Thank you to my patrons as always and I'll catch you guys next time.